today. Um, human alter human. Maybe we'll chat more today. I don't know. We'll see. Um, all right, so it's more... He's getting into more into the religious stuff, I think, yeah. The asceticism and stuff like that, I think. So, uh, yeah, I'm reading Friedrich Nietzsche, Human All to Human, a book for free spirits, R.J. Hollingdale's translation. All right, I'll just immediately begin here. 137. There is a defiance of oneself of which many forms of asceticism are among the most sublim sublimated expressions. For certain men, for certain men feel so great a need to exercise their strength and lust for power that in default of, uh, of other objects or because their efforts in other directions have always miscarried, they at last hit upon the idea of tyrannizing over certain parts of their own nature over, as it were, segments or stages of themselves. Exactly. Uh, that's this ascetic stuff here, right? But he will, Nietzsche will later talk about in genealogy of morals, a sort of philosophical asceticism, kind of. But, you know, as uh, typically with Nietzsche, there is always a, you know, a, a different way of looking at the same concept but in different different perspective and also uh, that's the thing with him it's always you always have to consider all the for and against for and against you don't settle you don't you don't that's with Nietzsche you know he doesn't settle uh, he wouldn't have settled even in the will to power that's you know a lot of people think uh, he built, or, or his sister actually, tried to make it as that, as if he was going to make a system. But it's not a system. <clears throat> but it was ambitious. But, it, it, in, you know, he, he, he dropped the will to power book and started with the reevaluation of everything, of all values. Thus, some thinkers confess Thus, some thinkers confess to views which are plainly not calculated to increase or improve their reputation. Some downright call down the disrespect of others upon themselves when, when by keeping silent they could easily have remained respected men. Others retract earlier opinions and are not afraid of henceforth being called inconsistent. On the contrary, they strive to be called so and behave like high-spirited riders who like their steed best only when it has grown savage, is covered with sweat and is tamed. Thus a man climbs on dangerous paths in the highest mountains so as to mock at his fears and trembling knees. Thus a philosopher adheres to views of ex... There you go. Actually, he keeps this. He keeps this thought. This thought he will keep. Uh, he keeps this in uh, your knowledge of morals, which is a little bit later, you know, a couple of years later, actually. And, you know, he keeps this thought. Thus, a philosopher adheres to views of asceticism, humility, and holiness in the light of which his own image becomes extremely ugly. Right. But it's still a part, you know, like it's still a... This division of oneself, this mockery of one's own nature, this spernere se sperni, spernere se sperni, answer, con, answer contempt with contempt. Right. Spernere, contempt. Uh, this spernere se sperni, of which the religions have made so much, is actually a very high degree of vanity. The entire morality of the Sermon on the, on the Mount belongs here. Man takes a real delight in oppressing himself with excessive claims and afterwards idolizing this tyrannically demanding something in his soul. In every ascetic morality, man worships 
a part of himself as God, and for that he needs to uh, diabolize the other part. part. Right. So he makes the other part the devil. But it makes a good point here. But still, um, you, you can still see that he, he, thus a philosopher adheres to views of asceticism. Humility and holiness in the light of which his own image becomes extreme lively. But it is something that happens. That's the thing. So it's pretty interesting because usually highest mountains will be something of a positive thing. But here it's a dangerous path. Although, well, you know, a lot of time he will say it's a dangerous thing. And still that's a good thing. You know, Live dangerously, he says. But that's the thing with Nietzsche. We should take his later words in, you know, the longer we go, the the more we get to his, you know, he has filtered out a lot of stuff. It's unfortunate that he didn't live longer. Nietzsche sucks. Long live Kant. <laughs> no. Nietzsche is much better than Kant. <clears throat> 138. <clears throat> Man is not equally moral all the time. That fact is well known. If one judges his morality according to his capacity for great self-sacrificing resolution and self-denial, which protracted and grown to a habit, constitutes holiness, then it is in his effects that he is most moral. Higher excitation presents him with quite novel motivations which, in his more usual cold and sober state, he would perhaps not even believe himself capable of. How does this come about? Probably through the proximity to one another of all great and highly exciting things. Once a man has been brought to a state of extraordinary tension, he can resolve equally well to take a fearful revenge or to break himself of his thirst for revenge. Under the influence of violent emotion, he desires in any event the great, tremendous, prodigious, and if he happens to notice that the sacrifice of himself satisfies him as much as, or even more than the sacrifice of another, he chooses it. All he is really concerned with, therefore, is the discharge of his emotion. You see, discharge of his emotion. There is a little bit of discharge, like... Uh, like the discharge of power that he, he mentions that later in uh, Beyond Good Evil. It's a little bit similar, the discharge of his emotion. All he's really concerned with, therefore, is the discharge of his emotion. To relieve his state of tension, he seizes the, the spears of his enemies and buries them in his own breast. But there is something great in self-denial, and not only in revenge, must have been inculcated into man only through long habituation. A divinity who sacrifices himself was the strongest, most effective symbol of this kind of greatness. Right. Uh, as the overcoming of the foe, as the overcoming of the foe hardest to conquer, the sudden mastering of an effect, effect, the sudden mastering of an effect that is how this denial appeared. And to this extent, it is counted as the summit of the moral. Right? You know, he, that's why also he speaks up beyond the moral. In reality, what is involved is the exchange of one, one idea for another, with the feelings remained at the same level of elevation and flood. When they are grown sober again and are resting from this effect, Men no longer understand the morality of those moments, but the general admiration of all who has experienced, experienced it sustains and supports them. Pride is their consolation when the effect and an understanding of their deed fades away. So there's a lot of psychologizing. Thus, these acts of self-denial also are at bottom not moral, insofar as they are not performed strictly for the sake of others 
the case rather is that the other only offers the highly tensed heart an opportunity to relieve itself through this self-denial. Remember here, it's asceticism. 139. Uh, let me see how much there is from this. The religious life. Oh, I could I could finish actually this chapter. Yeah. From the souls of the artists. That's later. There is a sort of uh, asceticism he talks about with philosophers from that perspective. But uh, obviously he, he'll say, but it's not self-denial. There is a difference there. I wouldn't say that that part that is a self-denial. That's more of a discipline thing. <clears throat> because he does live more and more minimally, you know, more and more away from, you know, people or leave it through his self denial, right? 139. In many respects, the ascetic too seeks to make life easier for himself. And he does does so, you know, it, it simplifies life, right? And he does so as a rule by complete subordination to the will of another or to a comprehensive law and ritual, somewhat in the way in which the Brahman decides nothing whatever for himself, but is guided every moment by holy writ. You see, he is, uh, he has a lot of Eastern influence as well, which is not weird because, you know, Schopenhauer and so forth. Uh, you know, venturing into Buddhism and stuff like that. This subordination, this subordination is a powerful means of becoming master of oneself. So there is a sort of, you know, uh, self-discipline here, right? One is occupied and thus not bored, and yet one's own willfulness and passions are not in any way involved. Well, I think there is actually a middle ground one could reach here. You can have the self-discipline and still you, your passions are also involved, so to speak, but as a motivating factor. But that's more me and not Nietzsche here. And passions are not in any way involved, right? Because that's not really what he's talking about. After one has acted, there is no feeling of responsibility and therefore no pangs of remorse. One has renounced one's own will once and for all. And this is easier than renouncing it only now and again. Just as it is easier to relinquish a desire altogether than to enjoy it in moderation, right? It's, yeah, that's actually true in a lot of ways. It's easier, if you're gonna, let's say you're gonna stop eating bread, it's much easier to just totally get rid of it um, because otherwise, if you eat a little bit, it's harder to maintain, you know, sometimes you will go extreme here and sometimes you wanna deprive yourself of it, but you know, you will probably bounce back. So yeah, it, it is, uh, yeah. If we recall the relationship between man and state, now obtaining, we discover that there too, there too unconditional obedience is more comfortable than conditional. The saint thus makes his life easier through this complete surrender of his personality. And one deceives oneself if one admits in this phenomenon the supreme heroic feat of morality. It is in any event harder to maintain one's personality without vacillation or dissimulation than it is to free oneself of it in the way described. And it demands, moreover, a lot more spirit and reflection, right? Yeah, exactly. To, to have it like, a, well, actually, what I, what I said, you know. Uh, th there is something in between here that it could be possible, right? It is possible. 140. After having discovered in many actions more difficult to explain that pleasure in emotion as such, I would also recognize in regard to the self-contempt, which is one of the characteristics of self saintliness, right? Self-contempt. But that's a thing Nietzsche is totally against, this whole self-contempt, you know? He's for life, always. 
that pleasure in emotion as such. I would also recognize in regard to the self-contempt, which is one of the characteristics of saintliness. You know, like you, you focus, on, there's a lot of Christian stuff here. Like, of course, it's not just Christian, but it is similar in Buddhism as, as well. And so on. But you devote yourself to God as well. Right, he's talking about asceticism. Characteristics, characteristics of saintliness, and likewise in acts of self-torture, through hunger and flagellation, flagellation, dislocation of limbs, simulation of madness, and means by which these natures combat the general enervation of their will to live, their nerves. They employ the most painful stimulants and cruelties so as, at least for a time, to emerge out of that boredom and torpor into which their great spiritual indolence and their subordination to the will of another just described so often plunges them. Right. The most usual means of, a, of the ascetic and saint employs to make his life nonetheless endurable and enjoyable consists... Uh, let me read that. <laughs> 141, right? The most usual means the ascetic and saint employs to make his life nonetheless endurable and enjoyable, consists in occasionally waging war and in the alteration of victory and defeat. This end he requires an opponent. No, to this end he requires an opponent and he finds him in the so-called enemy within. Right? The enemy within. To Nietzsche, you know, you yourself is not an enemy. Life is not an enemy. You're, we're not going, going to go against life. Although... This is great. I mean, uh, this book is great because it goes into details. Uh, it's a precursor for the later stuff. Uh, you know, he has settled from this. So that's the thing, you know, like I said, filtering out after, mo you know, you go pro and con, pro and con, you know, for and against, for and against, for and against. But once that has settled there, you know, you continue. And that's basically Nietzsche's method, you know, in a lot of ways. I do think, uh, I do think uh, Walter Kaufman is right a, a lot about that. Uh, there is a lot of truth in that, in his method. Uh, but there, is, there are also certain things that, that could be, you know, captured and, you know, put together and, and you kind of have his, his core belief. Because it's not like he never, you know, he settles on some stuff, you know. He, he never questions, for example, uh, you know, it's always the masses versus the few, for example. Um, the will to power, uh, eternal, he, you know. Uh, he, he questions everything, but... Uh, But there are some things that are impossible to, you know, you can question them in that, you know, who has a will to power, for example. But the fact that will to power is there, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a thing. But, I mean, it's not that wrong, actually. But. And the whole overman, I mean, Ubermensch, I think it's very uh, misunderstood, actually. You got to remember, over an animal. He mentions in this book, in Human All to Human, the over, over animal. You know, there is an aphorism called over animal. And, and we're constantly to, be over, to overcome ourselves because that's exactly what we did. Like, the, the more you overcome this animalistic side of, a, you know, our uh, animalistic side, the more we become human, actually. And we're not as close to the animal kingdom anymore. But that's what makes us human. That is the thing that makes us unique. Of course, we can talk about, you know, intelligence and this and that, but you can see those things in animals. But there is some, something that you can't see in animals. And that's actually taking a step much, you know, taking a much stronger step. Uh, like Nietzsche says, you know, higher species, right? Higher, higher and higher, going higher. He says higher. I don't think that implies, you know, superior and, and inferior. 
Actually, in one way, it is actually, in fact, superior. It is superior because we could potentially survive the longest of, of everything that exists in terms of intelligence. And so in that sense, it is superior. Uh, but we, we could also screw it up, of course. But yeah, I think that's actually a very good summarization there. Um, anyway. Occasional waging war in the alteration of victory and defeat. The ascetic type here. To this, well, the saint and ascetic. To this end, he requires an opponent and he finds him in the so-called enemy within. He exploits especially his tendency to vanity, right? To a thirst for honors and domination, then his sensual desires in an attempt to see his life as a continual battle and himself as a battlefield upon which good and evil spirits wrestle with alternating su success. It, it is well known that sexual fantasy, no, sensual, but we will get to sexual here. It is well known that sensual fantasy is moderated, indeed almost suppressed, by regularity in sexual intercourse, while it is, on the other hand, unfettered and dissolute when such intercourse is disorderly or does, does not take place at all. The fantasy of many Christian saints has been dirty to an uncommon degree, right? The more you suppress, the actually worse it can get, actually. By virtue of the theory that these desires are actually demons raging within them, they do not feel any very great sense of responsibility for this state of, for this state of things. It is to this feeling that we owe the instru instructive candidness of their self-confessions. Self-confessions. It has been in their interest that this struggle should be in progress all the time to some degree, since, as already said, it provides entertainment for their tedious life. <laughs> yeah. But so that this struggle should seem sufficiently momentous to excite the continuing interest and admiration of the non-saints. Sensuality, sensuality had to be more and more stigmatized as heretical. Indeed, the danger of everlasting damnation was associated so closely with these things that it is highly probable that throughout whole ages of ages, throughout throughout whole ages, Christians even begot children with a bad conscience, whereby a great injury has certainly been done to mankind. And yet here truth is stood completely on its head, which is in the case of truth particularly unbecoming. Christianity had indeed said, every man is conceived and born in sin. I mean, to me, to say that is a sin to me, but anyway. Christianity had indeed said, I think Nietzsche has said something similar somewhere. Christian, I think maybe in Zarathustra. Christianity had indeed, had indeed said, every man is conceived and born in sin. And in the insupportable superlative Christianity of uh, Calderon, uh, let me, there is a note here. Calderon, Calderon, Pedro Calderon de la Barça. Ah, right. Spanish, uh, Spanish dramatist. De la Barca. Yeah, I re recognize Calderon, I think. 1600 to 81. Um, I've, I've uh, been in Barcelona many, many times. Technically, it's Barca. There was a Roman general. Barcelona is named after a Roman general. Or a Roman leader. Well, general, I think. And his name was Barca. <laughs> As C is pronounced K in uh, Roman Latin. And so technically it should be Barca or Barcelona. <laughs> but that's not what it is. Hello, Gabasso. What's up? I'm reading Nietzsche. That's what's up. <laughs> I'm Italian. Oh, cool. That's, um, yeah. I'm speaking of Romans here, um, but yeah. So, uh, speaking of Italian, let's get back to Christianity here. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, Christianity of Calderon, right? Or Cal Calderon, I think. 
uh, this idea was again nodded. Let me reread that. Christianity had indeed said, every man is conceived and born in... So this is Nietzsche, by the way. I'm reading Human All to Human by Friedrich Nietzsche. Christianity had indeed said, every man is conceived and born in sin. And in the uh, insupportable superlative Christianity of Calderon, a uh, uh, Spanish dramatist, this idea was again knotted and wound together. Uh, one together so that he ventured on the most perverse paradox there is in the well-known lines the greatest guilt of man is that he was born i mean he's right you know i studied nietzsche last year oh that's great uh yeah in all pessimism so that's why nietzsche will increasingly see it as you know christianity as pessimistic and negative and against life you know the greatest guilt of man is that he was born i mean then why even create us you know why even create us in all pessimistic religions the act of procreation is felt as being bad in itself but this feeling is by no means common to all mankind and even the pessimists are not unanimous on the ma in the matter empedocles right so empedocles pre-socratic philosopher yes uh, hello, Sango, Doctor, Doctor Sango. Empedocles, for example, knows nothing whatever of the disgraceful, diabolical, sinful, in erotic things. On the contrary, he sees upon the great field of misfortune only one apparition that promises hope and salvation. Aphrodite, Aphrodite. To him, she is a guarantee that strife will not rule forever but will one, one day hand over the scepter to a gentler daimon. The Christian practical pessimists had, as aforesaid, an interest in seeing that a different opinion remained dominant. They required for the solitude and the spiritual wasteland of their life an enemy, uh, an enemy always on the alert. And an enemy, moreover, that was universally recognized through the combating and overcoming of whom they could repeatedly appear to the non-saints as half-incomprehensible supernatural beings. Did I say... Did I say half-saints? Non-saints. That was universally recognized through the combating and overcoming of whom they could repeatedly appear to the non-saints as half incomprehensible supernatural beings. If, if as a consequence of their mode of life and the ruination of their health, right, this enemy finally took flight forever, they at once knew how to see their inner world populated by new demons, right? Daimon demons. Actually, demons are not a bad thing in... Um, I remember correctly in uh, Jewish in at least in earlier Jewish thought uh, who are you talking about um, the rise and fall of the scales called pride and humility entertained their brooding heads just as well as did the alter alternation of desire and repose of soul in those days psychology served the end not only of casting suspicion on everything human, but of oppressing, scourging, and crucifying it. One wanted to believe oneself as bad and evil as possible. One sought fear for the salvation of one's soul, despair of one's own strength. Right. You can clearly see why Nietzsche goes against. Everything natural to which one attaches the idea of the bad and sinful, as for example is done even now in regard to the erotic, oppresses the imagination and makes it gloomy, because frightening to look upon causes men to haggle, because frightening to look upon causes men to haggle with themselves and deprives them of security and trust. Even their dreams acquire a flavor of tormented conscience. Right? <laughs> yes, that's very true there. This whole, you know, 
You basically make yourself unhealthy, you know, the suppression of yourself. It's a self-denial, this extreme asceticism. And yet this suffering from the natural in the reality of things is completely groundless, right? Here we go. It is only the consequence of opinions about things, right? Exactly. It is easy to see how designating, but of course you could go wrong in the other way as well. I mean, if it's too extreme, uh, you could destroy yourself in the other way, of course, but... Uh, but, you know, you, you need self-discipline, but you need enough self-discipline so that you, you know, you create your... Uh, whatever it is you want to create. And yet this suffering from the natural in the reality of things, uh, right, opinion about things. It is easy to see how designating the ineluctably natural as bad and then invariably finding it so makes men themselves worse than they need be. They need be, right? The artifice practiced by religion and by those metaphysicians who will have men evil and sinful by nature is to make him suspicious of nature and thus make himself bad. This being a consequence of his inability to divest himself of nature's garb. If he lives long in this natural dress, he gradually comes to feel weighed down uh, by such a burden of sins that supernatural powers are needed to lift it, right? This whole spiritual feeling here. And with that, and with that the need for redemption, we've already discussed steps upon the scene. The redemption we've already discussed, right? Steps upon the scene, answering to no actual, but only to an imaginary sinfulness, yes. But not just that, um, the whole weighing, uh, he had in a previous aphorism also this explanation of when you believe that this God thing is, you know, you look yourself in the mirror, but all you see is just error instead of, you know, when you compare it with God. Uh, and so this is a, a burden, you know, but when you think about God, it's unburdening, but also... You know, you negate life. You, 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 uh, you know, that, that's what happens here. In, in the extreme sense, you know. He's not talking about any, you know, he's talking about saints and ascetic uh, Christians or ascetic, you know, holy men and so forth. Monks. To, uh, but not just monks, but, you know. Uh, answering to no actual, but only to an imaginary sinfulness. Uh, go through the moral demands exhibited in the documents of Christianity one by one and you will find that in every case they are exaggerated so that man could not live up to them, right? It's like impossible. Uh, hello, uh, Joseph. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but, all right, so, so yeah. Uh, exaggerate. You, you can't really, you know, they make the rules so hard that, you know, on purpose. So the man could not live up to them. The intention is not that he should become more moral, but that he should feel as sinful as possible. If man had failed to find this feeling pleasant, why should he have engendered such an idea and adhere to it for so long? Just as in the world of antiquity, an immeasurable quantity of spirit and inventiveness had been expended on augmenting joy in life through festive cults. So in the era of Christianity, an immeasurable amount of spirit has likewise been sacrificed to another endeavor. Man was by every means to be made to feel sinful and thereby become excited, right? animated, and live in general. Also, it's, uh, also it's almost a... Uh, opposite of the Roman, right? It's in the Jewish uh, sphere, but it, it has Hellenistic, you know, Christianity has Hellenistic inspiration. But in, in a lot of ways, it is the opposite there. In terms of this asceticism. Yeah. To excite, animate, and live in at any price, is that not the watchword of an en enervated, overripe, overcultivated age? Let me just take a sip here.
the circle of our all natural sensations had been run through a hundred times. The soul had grown tired of them. Right, you know, it's um, so basically it was too much. There had been a lot of this naturalness and it was time to go the opposite way, right? Uh, that's the thing here. The, the circle of our all natural, because he says, you know, but why would they do this unless there is a sort of a desire for this? Hello, uh, JT Steele. Uh, you know, like he said here, you know, if man had failed to find this feeling pleasant, right, this whole ascetic thing, why should he have engendered such an idea and here, adhere to it for so long? But he, he would say, you know, we have to go back to that. Not, not the ascetic, I mean uh, the natural. The circle of all natural sensations had been run through a hundred times. The soul had grown tired of them. Thereupon the saint and the ascetic invented a new species of stimulant. Right? So it is, a brilliant, it is in that way a brilliant, which is something he will say later also. In that way it is a, kind of a genius way, even though he's going against it. That's the thing with Nietzsche, uh, you know, uh, j just because, because he sees it, you know, more objectively than just that. Although he does take it personal as well, in, to a certain extent. They presented themselves before all eyes, not really so that many might in, in, imitate them, but as frightful and yet delightful spectacle, performed on the borderline between world and overworld, where in those days everyone believed they beheld now rays of heavenly light, now uncanny tongues of flame flickering up from the depths. The eye of the saint directed upon the dreadful significance of the brevity of earthly life, upon the proximity of the final decision in regard to endless new vistas of life. There is another thing that he... The vistas of life. This burning eye and the body have destroyed this burning eye and body have destroyed made the men of the ancient world tremble in their very depths. To gaze at him, suddenly to look away, to feel again the attraction of the spectacle, to surrender to it, to satiate oneself with it until the soul was convulsed with fire and icy fevers. This was the last pleasure antiquity invented, after it had grown apathetic even to the sight of animal and human com combats. That was actually very, he must have been very inspired that at the end there. <laughs> that wasn't as, uh, you know, cold, so to speak. And then, then he gets more and more warm, like typical Nietzsche. Although, of course, it's always beautifully written, but... Two more pages and I'm actually done with this chapter. I should probably end the stream there, actually, because, uh, or maybe restart or something. Uh, because, uh, yeah, because it's easier for next time for the, for the title as well. Uh, but anyway, so, so, so yeah, it, it's, um, it's a whole thing here. Um, you're going to remember when I'm talking about this, think of Roman times, think of, you know, Christianity and so forth in ancient times, right? You know, the ancient world tremble in their very depths, right? To gaze at him, at him, he means the ascetic Christian. Suddenly to look away, to feel again. So uh, that was the last. So you see here, look away, to feel again the attraction of the spectacle, to surrender to it satiate oneself with it until the soul was convulsed with fire and icy fevers. This was the last pleasure antiquity invented. After it had grown apathetic even to the sight of animal and human combats. Right. That was the last pleasure, but then, you know, Well, uh, it was, he says also, tired of this beforehand, you know. Like he says here, 
because because this is the way he explains it because you know why would someone invent such a pleasure of self-denial and self-hatred basically you know this sinfulness and all that stuff and so the explanation is well in this uh, this this is one explanation he's not saying you know typically with Nietzsche this is not the ultimate and be all and end all of everything you know <laughs> uh, this is one way of looking at it this mini thing here you know uh Epigrams and aphorisms. Uh, you know, it, it's a way of looking at it. Uh, of course, you could probably expand a lot here on just that one, but there, you know, he, he wants to do more, not just that. 142. To summarize what has been said, right? To that condition of the soul in which the saint, or one becoming a saint, rejoices is composed of elements with which we are all very familiar, except that in the light of other conceptions that the religious they appear, uh, no, except that in the light of the other conceptions then the religious they appear in other colors, and then they usually incur the censor of mankind as surely as garnished with religion and ultimate meaning of existence. And the ultimate meaning of existence. They can count on admiration or indeed worship, or at least could count on them in earlier ages, right? In earlier ages. <clears throat> now the saint practices that defiance of oneself that is a close relation of lust for power and bestows the feeling of power even upon the hermit. Now his distended sensibility leaps out of the desire to allow his passions free reign over uh let me just hello frostbite <laughs> it's been a while uh now the saint practices so i guess it's back to uh, co uh current day i think no wait uh let me see here no it doesn't have to be that way Well, yeah, I think so. He ends on earlier ages. And now, now the saint practices that defiance of oneself that is a close relation of lust for power and bestows the feeling of power even upon the hermit. Now his distended sensibility leaps out of the desire to allow his passions free reign over into the desire to break them like wild horses under the mighty impress of a proud soul impress now he desires a complete cessation of sensations of a disturbing tormenting stimulating kind a waking sleep a lasting repose in the womb of a dull beast and plant-like indolence now he seeks conflict and ignites it in himself right 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 because boredom has shown him its yawning face he scourges his self idolatry with self contempt and cruelty. He rejoices, rejoices in the wild riot of his desires, in the sharp sting of sin, indeed in the idea that he is lost. He knows how to lay a trap for his effects, for example, that of the extremist lust for power, so that he passes over into the extremist abasement, and his hunted soul is wretched, utterly out of joint by, his, by this contrast. And when finally he comes to thirst for visions, for uh, colloqui colloquies with the dead or divine beings, colloquies, it is at bottom a rare kind of voluptuousness he desires, but perhaps that voluptuousness within which all other kinds are knotted together. Novalis, one of the authorities in questions of saintliness by experience and instinct, once blurted out the whole secret with naive rapture it is sufficiently marvelous that not long ago the association of voluptuousness religion and cruelty called the attention of men to their inner relatedness and common tendency yeah <clears throat> uh who do you mean here
he's talking about saints, holy men. If you mean in general, right? Uh, Novalis is a poet, German poet, uh, 1700. Well, late, I think, right? Uh, yeah, late. Uh, he died young, actually. But in general, uh, he's talking about, you know, uh, uh, the sort of priest. Actually, even even this whole feeling before this he he what I, what i explained a little bit earlier um that uh you know it, it today it becomes this power power thing you know you wanna he wants to st he stimulates himself basically extremist lust for power you know uh, for example that of the extremist lust for power so that he passes over into the extremist abasement extremist abasement and his haunt and his haunted soul is wretched, utterly out of joint by this contrast. And when finally he becomes... So, you know, would you recommend this book for a deep read? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Definitely, yes. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, but, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I won't... Uh, I won't, uh, I will end the stream soon, actually, but, well, maybe we could talk a little bit if you want to do that, but, um, because it's perfect to end it at, you know, this chapter. I, I will be done with this chapter. 143. It is not what the saint is. So when he says saint here, you know, the extreme, the ascetic, so he's talking about ascetics, uh, asceticism. And uh, he's talking about saints, and and but saint here can mean you know monk, priest, and so forth. It is not what the saint is, but what he signifies in the eyes of the non-saints, that gives him his world historic value, because he was mistaken for what uh, he was not, because his psychological states were interpreted falsely, and he was set as far apart as possible from everyone else as though he were something altogether incomparable, strange and suprahuman, right? He, he did explain here that it's not suprahuman, it's just like a self-hatred and self-denial. you know, denial. That is how, but there is a pleasure in that. He even explains it that way. I, I just, you know, uh, that is how he acquired the extraordinary power with which he was able to dominate the imagination of whole nations and whole ages. You know, the whole of Christian after the Roman, right? Roman Empire. Christian history. He himself did not know himself. He himself deciphered the characters of his moods, inclinations and actions by means of an art of interpretation that was exaggerated and artificial as the numerical interpretation of the Bible. What was perverse and pathological in his nature, with its coupling together of spiritual poverty, deficient knowledge, ruined health, and overexcited nerves, was concealed from his own sight just as it was from that of his spectators, right? So he himself, the saint, is as blind to, to his nature here, to this, not natural nature, it's not natural, but to this artificial nature, so to speak. This, this you know, only, only humans are capable of this asceticism, you know? Like uh, deliberately just focusing on God and everything that is earthly is sinful and you know evil and so forth. And you know he, he should not eat as much and you know that that's why the whole fasting thing, probably why he looks down on fasting in Nietzsche. But there is actually a good way of using fa you know fasting has its uh, has its positive. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, practical use but and also is healthy to a certain extent but i would say you know this is not healthy you know uh, to be that ascetic is not healthy you're actually suppressing yourself so uh 
so yeah, concealed from his own sight, just as it was from his spectators, right? Spectators, everyone else that's not seen. He was not a, and he says spectator because, like I said earlier, uh, it was like a spectacle to these in the ancient world because it's a totally different thing. The ancient world usually they you know had these festivals and and uh, you know sacrificed animals and drank wine and, and so forth, you know? <laughs> Not just wine, but, you know, lived like that. Um, but that's the opposite in terms of Christian asceticism. He was not an especially good man, even less an especially wise one, but he signified something that exceeded the ordinary human portion of goodness and wisdom, right? There is the... But it's... You know, I almost said, you know, ordinary human, but he says, you know, the ordinary human portion of goodness and wisdom. You know, it's more specific. All right. Uh, although, well, you know, it's almost the same thing there, but human intelligence. But anyway, belief in him, belief in him lent support. So belief in the same. Belief in him lent support to belief in the divine and miraculous, in a religious meaning of the existence in a religious meaning of existence, in an imminent day of judgment, right? So it looks, uh, that's why he says, that's how he thinks probably, well, at this point, at, at least in this um, aphorism here, that maybe that's how, maybe that's how uh, people slowly became Christian and maybe that's why it spread because they could see how extremely meaningful it could be for this person. And then maybe, you know, it looks like, well, there is something to this, you know, uh, when you look at it just like that. Uh, in the evening glow, and also, I mean, there is actually a physical thing here as well. If you're fasting that much, for example, you know, abstaining from all these things and having this extreme self-discipline, and, and with fasting, uh, you will begin, you know, uh, to have much stronger imagery and hallucinations and stuff like that. So it's not that weird, actually. This makes perfect sense, actually. Although I'm not, you know, maybe this isn't, I would say, I wouldn't say this is the main reason why Christianity spread, uh, but I, I can see his, uh, I can see his point here that it looks uh, like it, it, it shows, you know, Belief in him lends support to belief in the divine and miraculous, in a religious meaning of existence, in an imminent day of judgment. Uh, in the evening glow of the sun, of the coming end of the world, that shone over all, that shone over all Christian peoples, the shadow of the saint grew to monstrous size, to such a height, indeed, that even in our age, which no longer believes in God, there are still thinkers who, who believe in the saints. Right. Right. You know, the whole no longer believes in God, right? God is dead, you know. But that's later in uh, the gay science. Uh, I read a little bit of gay science. It's such a great book. Uh, but yeah. 144. It goes without saying that this depiction of the saint, which is sketched after the average profile of the whole species, you know, that, you know, it's a general. He's not going into, you know, uh, uh, average profile of the whole species can be countered by many depictions which might evoke more pleasant feelings. Individual exceptions stand apart from the species in general, either through great gentleness and philanthropy or through the charm of an uncommon degree of energy. Others are, are in the highest degree attractive because their whole being is flooded with the light of this, uh, uh, with the light of certain delusions, as for example was the case with the celebrated founder of Christianity, right, Jesus, who regarded himself as the innate son of God, and as a consequence felt himself to be sinless, so that through this conceit, which ought not to be judged too harshly, since the whole of antiquity swarmed with sons of gods, that's true, yeah, he attained. So it's not you know. Uh, too harshly because you know there are many that were like this he attained the same goal the feeling of complete sinlessness complete 
on accountability, which nowadays everyone can acquire through scientific study. Right? Well, you know, uh, that is true, like this whole unaccountability, because your nature is, but that's earlier. And, uh, but that, that's why he said earlier also in the earlier stream when I said something like, uh, when I read that, uh, a similar thing can be achieved, but in the natural sense, you know, in, in the scientific or scientific sense. Well, almost the same thing, yeah. He does unite those. Um, because science, you know, uh, mimics uh, na nature. He says something like that. Well, the models, I, I would say, the models try to imitate nature. But yeah, so, so the whole complete accountability thing is that, well, well, complete sinlessness and complete unaccountability, right? So you can get it this way, but he, of course, he sees this as, the, you know, it's not the natural or the healthy or the better way, or not just better, but uh, it's not the most truthful way because nature is the most truthful that we can talk about, reality, so to speak. But... Um, but the unaccountability, like I said, is, or almost said, <laughs> is this whole thing that, you know, you're not accountable for the, the actions you take really, really, because you're born into what you are. You know, you, you can't really uh, control. You can control to a certain extent, of course, but, uh, uh, or even if you control, like these ascetics, that gets unhealthy. But if you don't, you know, you can go both ways, of course, but. Um, but, but, but still, uh, your personality, you're born with it, you know, so, uh, anyway, so that's why, you know, unaccountability, which nowadays everyone can acquire through scientific study, so that's what he believed up until here, you know, 1878, uh, that, you know, you can acquire this through scientific study, you don't need religion. I, I have likewise taken no account of the Indian saints, who occupy and inter so this is inter you know it's interesting that he people always talk about the Christianity but he has a lot of uh, Eastern uh, thoughts and influences as well. I have likewise taken no account of Indian saints who occupy an intermediate position between the Christian saint and the Greek philosopher, and to this extent do not represent a pure type, knowledge, science, insofar as there was any elevation above other men through logical discipline and schooling have been demanded by the Buddhists as a sign of sainthood to the same extent as these qualities are rejected and denounced as signs of unholiness in the Christian world. He does like Buddhism a little bit more uh, usually. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that makes sense late, with later Nietzsche as well. So uh, I'm going to end it here. Um, that was the chapter called The Religious Life. The Religious Life. And next time we'll get to four, uh, fourth chapter from the souls of the artists and writers. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit other stuff. So, but yeah. Um, he does talk more about um forget the name now uh in the hindu uh oh what was that called ah book of manu right book of manu he mentions that a lot later yeah book the book of manu manu's laws or whatever Manus Mitri. Uh, but, yeah. But, but it, there, uh, Nietzsche thinks in the, in the Hindu here, Indian saints, right? Um, Nietzsche will talk about, well, that's later, but still, uh, he talks about at least there is a manliness, you know, at least there is a structure of, or natural structure, you know. He's not for... Uh, artificial structures either. So Nietzsche is always, that's also a constant through, with Nietzsche. It's always with the natural, 
what happens in nature. Not just, you know, obviously from the human perspective, like we try to overcome our animal, but uh, at the same time, he, he wants to do that in, re you know, we do that in reality. And we've always done that in reality. That's the thing. You, you don't do that. You, you can't achieve that really. That's just, um, you know, um, like he said here, it, it will just be a delusion, you know. Uh, or he said something like that. Uh, but, but yeah. So, uh, if you want to, you can vote for the next book I should read. It will be Spinoza or uh, Nietzsche again or, or uh, Rousseau. And uh, you can choose which book. Uh, you can, you can get to the info panels, info, info page, info panels. And uh, yeah, you can vote for it there or in the chat here. And uh, you can also get to the um, uh, Nietzsche had, hello, uh, Athamis, Athamis. Nietzsche had a good view. You can, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel as well if you want to. Nietzsche had a good view of achievement. I don't know what you mean by that, view of achievement. His view of achievement. You, you mean like success and stuff like that? But it didn't tell us how. Well, each person has to uh, discipline themselves and also listen to their, you know, and actually discharging their power, so to speak. Uh, that's probably what Nietzsche would have said. Although he would have said, you know, uh, the greats are doing that. Uh, you know, most people won't do that. That's what he would have said. You know, uh, it's not like everyone is the you know, everyone isn't good then. That's the thing. So uh, that's why there is no real, there is no guide towards that because uh, there is no need for, I mean, there is no need for it because each great will just automatically, they will follow their nature, you know. And that's a criticism he has against uh, Stoics as well, you know. How else could I be if not according to my nature, you know. <laughs> I can't be anything else. Yeah, you have to figure it out yourself. And also, uh, you would know it yourself, right? You know what your, what your desire. You, you know, or if you don't know this, I mean, uh, I don't know about you personally, but, but I'm just saying, uh, you have to know this instinctively here. And... Uh, so uh, yeah, and then you have to actually follow through as well and, and do that. But but and not just do that. You can't force yourself. Like it's an automatic thing. You are um, you couldn't live without this. You know, it's for example, if if philosophy or or any art, for example, not that philosophy is art. I wouldn't say it's the same thing, but. Uh, if you feel deprived, if you're not doing this, then you know that this is it, you know, this is it. And uh, you're hurting yourself if you're not doing that. You can only be free if you free other person. Uh, I don't know what that means. You can only be free if you free another person. Well, wouldn't you have to free yourself before you can free another person? Although uh, there is no... I don't agree with that at all. Like, there is no free. Uh, unless you clarify what you mean here. Because, uh, or do you mean free from another person? I mean, that is Nietzsche, to be free from another person. In terms of, you know, you, you distance yourself. You're not, you're not supposed to just repeat your master's words, for example. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to have a disciple that just repeats and parrots. He wanted an individual thinker. And that's why he didn't see that in Peter Gast, his, uh, his assistant, basically. That's why he didn't see him as that, because he, he wasn't you know, creating his own. 
And that's what Nietzsche valued there, creating his own. And he was his own. He even says, you know, I'm the last Dionysian. I'm the last of my kind, he said. So, uh, it all makes sense within his worldview. But, but, yeah. You have to free yourself to become someone to free others. Well, yeah, that's a little bit different than what you said earlier. Well, actually, there is a big difference. You have to free yourself first be before uh, to become someone to free others. Exactly. But uh, I would say, he also says, you know, uh, there is no... Es yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that would be true if, if you want to help someone uh, through a path. You know, uh, you kind of have to have free yourself from that path or solved yourself, so to speak, <laughs> in that path, your own problems in that path. Uh, but, you know, but each person has their own path. So you can't really even, in my opinion, you can't even really do that. Like, you can help, but there is only, only, only to a certain extent, because they themselves, in their own experience, I can't live your experience. So other people have to, in their own experience, like they have their own path. And so you can, all you can do is help if they want to help, if they want help. Uh, but, but technically, I can't do anything, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing. I, I'm stuck in my body. You're stuck in your body. I can do I can't really do anything. I can just tell you stuff. That's really it, you know. If you think about every and if you think about anyone that gives you advice or anyone that, you know, tells you this or that, uh, <laughs> you have to apply it. It's impossible for them to do this for you. Uh, uh, it's difficult to find out which path they are walking. Yes. Especially when you're young, probably, but uh, I mean, actually, it depends because I mean, that's the thing. If, if you understand your in instinctively here, you have to listen to your instinct and your instinct tells you who you are truly. But you have to reflect deep within yourself. If you're lost, you have to reflect deep, deep within yourself. Uh, and that and no one can do that for you. Only you can do that. Uh, so, but that's the thing, you know, when you're young, you also listen to a lot of opinions and so forth, and uh, it confu confuses you. But that's why, that's why a certain asceticism and a certain self-discipline is actually necessary, so that one can find oneself. Actually, there is no finding, just, uh, actually, I would, I should say this, there is no finding oneself, it's just clearing oneself up. <laughs> that's that's all it is because you're always well, you know you've always been this it's just that it's like muddy water instead of clear water uh, but it's still water all right that's the thing so but uh, i can give you my you know all advice come from a perspective given to someone who has his own perspective exactly Exactly. So exactly like I said, uh, if you know, I give my perspective to you know this advice, but this person has its own path. You know, I give the advice of the perspective from my path, but the other other person here walks a different path. Why is it a different path? Because we're two separate beings. We can't have the same path because our inclinations are different. You know. The way the stuff I'm attracted to and inclined towards will be different from this other person. Actually, it could be similar in the general sense. And that's why you could help each other in terms of, you know, you can be a mentor, for example. Uh, but uh, to be its own, 
this other person, the younger, let's say, usually it is, you know, and they will eventually, if they want to become their own, they will eventually have to go their own path. Uh, but yeah, of course you can have help in the when you're young. Oh, I feel home. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> that's great. But uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what else. But if you have any other questions, um, because uh, yeah, I will I will end the stream. I was thinking of ending the stream about here. Um, but yeah, that's the thing, and, and and that's why Nietzsche actually does go against a, a lot about this life guiders. He says, you know, life, the guiders in life and stuff like that. Probably because he, he he doesn't think that everyone can do this. I mean, m maybe universally. I mean, maybe if. But no, it's not possible because not everyone will have this philosophical or, you know, sensibility, you know. So we never reach each other, but we can become a part of something that connects us. I think, I think we're all always connected. Uh, I mean, we're connected in a lot of ways, uh, but um, it depends on what you mean here. Become a part of something that connects us. I mean, you, you could mean in a in a more grander, like in a more meaningful way, maybe. Uh, but yeah, we don't reach each other. Um, I do think we, you know, uh, hello, Prabhu Joshi. I'm actually ending the stream very soon, but um, uh, we do reach each other. We, we do connect, right? Th that's the thing. You're right. I mean, we don't really, uh, you know, it doesn't touch, but this sounds ridiculous, but part of a greater good. But that m depends on what you mean by greater good. Uh, if you mean by good, you know, um, a sort of, uh, well, yeah, uh, you know, continual survival, uh, then I would say, yeah, that's a good thing. But uh, do you think Candid translates well as it's satire? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. It's like poetry, right? It's almost impossible uh, to properly... Uh, that, that's why I want to learn German as well, so that I can read Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is very artistic in, in the way he's writing, in the style, and uh, you know, you, you will, you're missing stuff. I know that for sure, because there are... He plays with words and stuff like that. I've seen examples, and I can actually understand a lot of them, because uh, it looks like um, it looks like Swedish, uh, but that's because it's German. Uh, but yeah, satire. I mean, yeah, probably missing something there. Yeah, could be. Kind of depends on the translation as well, the translator. Uh, part of a greater good. I mean, that, that's such a, this whole you know part of a greater good here. We have to be more specific, you know. What, what's this greater good? You know, is is it the AI? <laughs> is the AI the greater good? And what what do we mean by greater good here? You know. Um, so yeah, it could be that, but yeah. So that's that, and. Uh, <laughs> I will have to end the stream here and we'll continue to the, with the next um, chapter next time. Greater good surviving, yeah. Uh, to me, that's that's the closer answer, yes. Yes. Because to me, it's not, you know, greater good in... What else can it be, you know? 
but it doesn't mean utopia. Well, utopia means nothing. So <laughs> utopia is nothing. But yeah, a great channel. I sub. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, we will. Uh, I will read. Uh, I'll continue. And uh, I hope you have a great evening and day and or whatever it is. And uh, I will see you soon again. And you can just rewatch the whole stream, of course, and uh, you know to catch up. Um, you know, but but it's up to you guys, of course. And uh, you know, like I said, <laughs> if we're separate, you can't control people. Anyway, uh, well, of course you can to a certain degree, but the inner you can't really. Anyway, uh, have a great evening, and uh, I will see you soon again. Goodbye.